Okay. Well, yikes. <laughs> yeah. Got what? We got like. Only today's that. It's less than that. We've got 17 people here today. 18, there we go. So, yeah, well, I'm hoping that, uh, I know it's a real riveting topic today, so I'm a little surprised, but uh, I'm hoping that this will clear up a little bit after spring break, because uh, we all need a little bit of spring break. Hope you enjoy your Tuesday uh, free of class, or at least of this class. So, uh, before we bump into pesticide safety and all that good stuff, uh, just a reminder that lab today will be meeting out at the Bayer Cropsides Farm. So, again, that is at 266 South Monroe Avenue if you are choosing to drive there yourself. It is super easy to get there because it's right off of 180. So, essentially, you could just get on 180, drive west towards Kernan, and about maybe... Five minutes out, you'll see the intersection for Monroe Avenue. You just hang a left to go south, and then uh, the station will be on your left about maybe half a mile, quarter of a mile down the road. It'll have a sign. There will be a bunch of cars parked there. It'll be uh, pretty clear that it is the Bayer Crop Science Farm. Uh, there is parking. Chances are it'll be pretty full, but you can park on the side of the road and just sort of take a little walk uh, to the station itself. So we'll be meeting there at about 2.30. Uh, just a reminder about the dress code. Uh, they require you wear long sleeves, long pants, closed-toed shoes. Uh, they recommend that you just take precautions against the sun as well. Not that that's going to be a real big deal today. Uh, as far as the tests are concerned, they are graded. Uh, I haven't posted the grades, and I don't have them to return to you. Uh, because I've got, I think, two tests that still need to be made up. So we're still waiting on those to come back in. But overall, they're looking reasonably good. I'd say similar to the last ones, we're probably going to be looking at a low B average again. Yep? I haven't put it into the spreadsheet yet. So, uh, yeah, so I need to go in there and actually move things around. Uh, in other announcements... The pheromone slash monitoring project is going to be uh, wrapping up here pretty soon. We're probably going to stop monitoring around mid-April, so the week or two after the break. Uh, over the break, I will post the write-up instructions and all that so you have an idea of what's expected. But if you've been out there monitoring, counting the pests, you should have all the data that you need to write the report. All right. So pesticides and hazards. Uh, one thing I want to define before we get going today is the difference between hazardous, uh, between hazard and risk. And the basic idea here is that all in all, pesticides are hazardous, meaning that they have some sort of inherent ability to produce an adverse effect, right? And it kind of gets back to what we've been talking about before. Pesticides are poisons, and as such, they are inherently dangerous to one extent or another. And this is why we spend a lot of time talking about pesticides, talking about how we roll them out, when we use them, and also talk about their safety, considering the fact that a lot of other control techniques we have, like resistant plant varieties, uh, you know, tillage and stuff like that, really don't pose much danger to people or the environment. Not nearly as much as pesticides do. And so ultimately, there can be a lot of sort of tangential areas in which pesticides can cause damage. Uh, things, the damage we talked about before, such as to beneficial organisms, non-targets in the surrounding area, but also a lot of dangers to people. Uh, so whether those are the applicators actually putting it in the field, uh, neighbors who share the same water resources, uh, when we start talking about things like groundwater contamination, our drift, or if it's the consumers who ultimately purchase the product in the store. And so there's a lot of interest around making sure that when we use pesticides, we're using them in the safest way possible. And consequently, it shows up on the IPM exam, and it shows up in a lot of IPM textbooks. So even though pesticides are inherently hazardous, they have their dangers just by the fact that they are what they are, what we can do is we can reduce those hazards and reduce those dangers by reducing what we call risk. Risk being the probability 
that the product will cause harm. And so when we're talking about pesticides, oftentimes what we're talking about is the dose. Uh, the dose is what makes a pesticide hazardous. So if we can find ways to dilute out the dose uh, when it comes into contact with other people, then we can reduce the danger to those consumers, to those applicators, whatever. Um, risk versus hazard is kind of a big buzzword in IPM right now. Uh, if you talk to uh, the head of UC IPM, Jim Farrar, uh, he starts out more or less all of his talks about IPM and what they want to do at the UC by saying that their goal is to reduce risk as much as possible. And not only that, they also want to drive down hazard by reducing the amount of pesticides being used. So this is kind of the big discussion right now, is how do we reduce hazard and risk at the same time? So essentially, the point being that hazard is innate, but risk is alterable. So by reducing the risk of the exposure to these pesticides, uh, using very simple precautions, we can make growing a lot safer and pest control especially a lot safer. So maybe a good example of hazard versus risk is something like a fire. Fire is in and of itself dangerous. That's just the reality of what fire is. It's destructive, it's uncontrolled release of energy. Fire can burn you, it can burn your belongings, and if it gets out of hand, there's not much you can do. Uh, but on the flip side, fire is also very powerful and very helpful, just like pesticides can be. And taking really very minor precautions to contain it within a certain area and to limit its spread uh, can allow you to use it very efficiently to basically get really good results. And so that's just the general idea around um, pesticides as well, that we want to set up the precautions we need. So before we get moving, I also wanted to talk about uh, toxicity real quick. So if the hazard of a pesticide is all tied up in its toxicity and its ability to do harm, how do we come up with those numbers? How do we determine which pesticides are more toxic or more dangerous, more hazardous than other ones are? And this all comes down to toxicology or the study of toxic interactions. So, which of course brings us back to uh, Paracelsus with his fancy hat and his medieval uh, background of his painting and all of that. And Paracelsus, if you remember, is the father of modern toxicology and his big quote was that all substances are poison, there are none that are not poisons. What differentiates poisons from what we consider normal everyday chemicals is just how much of those chemicals you need to take in order to have a toxic reaction. So it's all about the dose, right? Uh, you can have compounds like sugar where you have to eat like six pounds of it to get a toxic reaction, but I don't think I could eat six pounds of sugar uh, in the amount of time it takes to have a toxic dose. I think it would uh, make you sick before you got to that. Or you can have things like cyanide where you need just a bare fraction of an ounce to cause a toxic reaction. And so normally we would consider that chemicals that kill with very small doses to be toxins, those with very large doses to be non-toxic, even though they could potentially kill you. And hence, we use this sort of classification of what is what kills in the smallest doses versus the largest doses to establish our safety classes for pesticides that we talked about before, right? Uh, class one being the most toxic, getting that danger sign. These are things that kill with like less than a teaspoon of exposure, all the way down to class fours, which are considered so non-toxic that they don't really have limitations on exposure, uh, or at least not beyond wearing like jeans when you apply a pesticide, and they don't even get a... Uh, safety word to differentiate themselves. But so as far as determining these levels and determining what is toxic versus what isn't, it gets into this real divide in toxicology, which is acute toxicity as compared to chronic toxicity. So acute toxicity is essentially any adverse effects from a substance due to a single exposure or multiple exposures all in a very short period of time. So essentially, if you were exposed to a pesticide and you immediately keeled over, that would be acute toxicity. If a chemical got into your system, caused some sort of adverse effect, and uh, you know, it was very easy to notice, very measurable, very easy to link to the pesticide, right? And so acute toxicity is oftentimes the toxicity that we are most concerned about whenever we are talking about pesticides. 
Because we're concerned about the applicators being able to get out of the field. We're concerned about someone, say, um, uh, or acute toxicity to, say, our honeybees or our other beneficials, right? We want to have something that is extremely toxic to the pest while protecting everybody else. On the flip side, we have chronic toxicity. This being any adverse effects that are the result of long-term exposure um, to the toxicant. And so generally, chronic toxicity is going to be due to consistent low-dose exposure over an extended period of time, typically months or years. And the challenge with chronic toxicity is that while it can be extremely dangerous, uh, being exposed to really low doses over a long period of time can cause cancer, um, neural disorders, uh, all sorts of different diseases, the challenge is that these symptoms tend to appear very slowly over those periods, and oftentimes the symptoms are really hard to relate directly to the toxin, because you're dealing with all these interfering factors. It's easy if you're out in the field spraying nicotine and you got a whole you know, lung full of it and you have spasms to say, it's probably the nicotine, you know, but it's hard to say if you've been spraying crops for 30 years and you come down with um, lymphoma to say that it was definitely a pesticide. And even if you're pretty sure it was a pesticide, it's hard to say which one it was or if it was due to one big exposure or years and years and years of chronic exposure. And so we've got kind of this challenge, which is that acute toxicity is easy to measure. Chronic toxicity is relatively difficult. So for the most part, most pesticides are very well characterized in the acute category, but uh, there's a lot of pesticides out there being used right now where we're not entirely sure that they are safe in the long term. Is there any historical examples of uh, companies purposefully obfuscating the results of these chronic tests? Are, are, you, are you trying to lead me to a, to a certain I, answer? I, I, not. I will talk about some cases of that potentially happening a little bit later. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, I have, I have a slide on that in just a bit. So as far as measuring acute toxicity, uh, the main measure, and this is the typical measure that we use whenever you're establishing safety words. We use something called the lethal dose, or the LD. And this is a pretty simple measure. It's essentially just the amount of toxin required to kill the target organism. So LD is, in theory, really simple. The challenge, though, is that, like we talked about in the resistance section, right, are all individuals in a population, do they all have the same susceptibility to a toxin? No, thank you, <laughs> right? There is variability. Different genotypes give you different levels of susceptibility. So there isn't one dose that's just gonna kill all the individuals in a population. So instead, what researchers use and what people who come up with uh, exposure limits do is they use something called the LD50. And so this is the concentration of the toxin that would kill 50% of a population that was exposed to it. So ideally, if you went out and you sprayed a field with this concentration of the pesticide, it would kill 50% of the organisms that came into contact with it. And so the LD50 is not the dose that we spray on a field, clearly, because people don't want to kill 50% of the pests. They want to kill all the pests they can. But it is just useful as an industry and a scientific standard for establishing toxicity levels. And so essentially what you would do is you'd have a setup where you have a whole bunch of lab organisms. Uh, you would have them, say, in individual cages or cups. You would apply the pesticide to them at different concentrations. And then you would measure how many of them died. And then you could plot those results on this sort of graph, where what you've got on the y-axis is the percent mortality, so how many organisms died. And on the y-axis, we have a log scale of the dose. So moving from a low dose to a high dose. So you get this sort of line, where at low doses you have no real mortality, then mortality increases until you get to a dose where you essentially are killing 100% all the time, and so going much higher than that doesn't matter. So to figure out the LD50, you basically just look at the Y, you go over and see what part of the line is at the 50% mark of mortality, and then you just draw a line down at the uh, y-axis and you figure out what dose is there that causes the mortality. So that dose on the y is your LD50.
So typically for a pesticide, you would run this sort of test for the pest you're trying to target. So if you were trying to kill bead armyworms, you'd have a whole bunch of bead armyworms in little cups. You would, say, dose them with an artificial feed that has the toxin in it, and you'd see how many of them died. But you would also run this experiment, again, using our beneficials. So maybe you'd expose bees, lady beetles, um, maybe some other pests you're interested in killing. And you would also repeat this experiment with some sort of mammal, like a lab rat or a mouse. And you would see what's the dose that kills mammals. And we would use that as a proxy for toxicity to people, right? Uh, the current movement in the field, though, is that they're trying to develop tests where you can use human tissue reared out on a Petri dish and see if you can kill human tissue with a toxin instead. And that way they can move away from using rats and mice. Uh, on one level, that's nice from a not dosing animals with poisons level. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, it's nice because rats and mice don't react to toxins in the exact same way humans do. And so using actual human tissue might be a much more accurate way to measure toxicity effects. But right now, they're not re they don't have a test that works 100% real well, so they're still using rats and mice. But so ultimately, what you'll come out with is a dose that kills 50% of the population, and they'll measure that in milligrams of active ingredient per kilogram of body weight. And that's how you get your LD50. Uh, sometimes you might see something called an LC50. LC50 is just for aquatic organisms. So it's based around the concentration of active ingredient inside of a water solution that killed the organisms living in it. So essentially, uh, they'll almost always run tests to see the impact of pesticides on fish and various other aquatic wildlife. So they'll just put like a little fish in a cup of water and they'll drop a couple drops of pesticide in there and see if it has any toxic effect. All right. And so ultimately, the idea is that if you have a really low LD50, if the concentration to kill 50% of the population is really low, that means that the pesticide is highly toxic. If the LD50 is really high, you need a lot of milligrams per kilogram of body weight to kill the pest or the uh, uh, mammal system, then it's a, um, a relatively non-toxic pesticide. So just to give you a visualization, essentially uh, what this is, is this is a bee trial. So they were testing uh, bees at various life stages for the impact of some pesticides. So they had these cages with some Boy, that did not turn out clearly. These little blurry blobs are bees. <laughs> they uh, definitely are bees in there. So they have a cage. What we have here are little, um, it's kind of funny, the things that turn up in these studies, they're little ketchup things from like McDonald's. That you, you know, you, actually, McDonald's doesn't use the pump anymore, do they? Either way, you've seen those little ketchup holders. They've got a whole bunch of those, and so they've got little bee larvae inside them. And so essentially, They'll have a mixture at a max concentration. They'll spray the bees in one of the cages. They'll uh, maybe inject the toxin into the bee larva. Then they'll dilute it by half or maybe tenfold, repeat, dilute again tenfold or half, repeat. So you get these nice standard dilutions of the pesticide until you get to a point where it's so dilute it's functionally not existent in the system. All right. So... On one hand, these LD50s are used to determine how hazardous a pesticide is, and then on uh, the flip side, they are used practically to determine exposure limits for applicators and for people working with these chemicals. And typically, the exposure level that you see most in the industry is something called the TLV, or the threshold limit value. And this is the airborne concentration of a chemical that produces no adverse effect over long time periods. So essentially, this is the concentration where they say there's no chance of chronic toxicity at this level. The way they calculate that is essentially when you do your standard toxicology study, or you're building your curve for the LD50, you also calculate out what's called the null, or the no observable effect level. So this is the highest dose of pesticide where you saw no mortality uh, in any of your test populations. And so essentially you would find the null. This is, uh, in theory, the highest dose at which there's no immediate adverse effect. And then you would set your uh, threshold limit value 
somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times lower than that concentration. And so, essentially, because chronic exposure and chronic danger is hard to measure, they just sort of have to set an arbitrary bench point, which is 1,000 times lower than the maximum dose that doesn't have an effect. So this is kind of where you run into problems with chronic toxicity, because maybe there is a chronic effect, but it's not really tightly linked with the acute toxicity effect. And so it's kind of hard to figure out yeah, what is important and what isn't. All right, so as far as chronic toxicity is concerned, I've already talked about this a little, but just to reiterate, it is really difficult to measure chronic toxicity because, again, it really depends on how much you've been exposed and the fact that the cause and effect are really unclear in a lot of situations, and the symptoms oftentimes aren't super obviously related. So there are a couple ways we get at chronic toxicity. One of these are long exposure toxicology experiments. So essentially what you do with this sort of experiment is you would have, say, a rat, and you would continually expose that rat to very low doses of the toxin over its entire natural lifespan. And you would just sort of keep an eye on mortality when they die. You would open them up and see if they had tumors. You would try and figure out what killed them, if there's any sort of defects in any way. Um, of course, the challenge with this is rats don't live near as long as humans do. And so if there are truly long effects, then it's hard to tell. Plus, as we mentioned before, rats have different physiology from humans. And so the impact on rats does not always line up real well with the impact on humans. That's actually a really big problem in medical research right now, is that um, essentially a big way that they try and come up with drugs now is that you have these inbred mouse and rat lines that are uh, basically genetically bred to have diseases. So you can buy, like, white mice that have diabetes, right? You can, and that's not a joke. You can buy mice that are predisposed to develop lung cancer. You can buy mice that'll get any sort of disease. There are companies that have just huge mouse rearing facilities. And so what you can do is you can buy a whole bunch of diabetes mice, and, um, sorry? Yeah, diabetic mice. It's not as funny. <laughs> you're right. They are diabetic mice or pre-diabetic mice, right? So let's say you're trying to come up with a, 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 um, a, a medicine that can help prevent diabetes in people who have risk factors. So you buy a bunch of mice that have all these uh, factors that predispose them to diabetes, uh, and then you have a machine that basically develops a whole bunch of chemicals en masse, like thousands and thousands of these chemicals uh, that may have some impact on diabetes. And you basically just feed the mice these chemicals, and you measure which, which mice develop diabetes, which ones don't. And the chemicals that prevent diabetes from developing, you put into human trials, and you see if they work. The problem is they're realizing that, like, mouse diabetes and human diabetes aren't the same thing. <laughs> they're they're, uh, they're uh, on one level functionally similar, but on another... You know, human diabetes is a distinct set of genes in a very distinct organism. And so, uh, you know, they've got this problem where essentially you'll read this study where they're like, we've discovered seven new drugs that are going to fix diabetes. And then they put it in a human trial and none of them work. And this happens a lot. <laughs> and so people are looking for new ways to study that. And it's kind of a similar problem here, which is that with chronic toxicology, mice don't have the exact same system we do. And as such, it's really hard to say that something that causes tumors in mice doesn't ca does cause tumors in humans, and vice versa, things that don't cause problems in mice may cause problems in humans. So we need better tests for this sort of thing. How is PETA not suicide bombed those, those facilities? Those facilities? <laughs> oh, good Lord. I'm sure that they've got, uh, I'm sure they've got max uh, protection of some sort, lots of fences and security guards and all of that stuff. Oh, and then finally, because these studies don't always work really well, we have association studies, where basically you have some researcher who looks at people who are believed to have some level of exposure to a chemical over their lifespan, and you basically track them and see if they have any unusually high incidences of diseases in your test population. So let's say you're interested in people who develop diseases. You're interested, what about Roundup? Let's say, does Roundup cause 
diseases in applicators. You would basically go out, you'd sample the medical rector records of a couple thousand uh, farmers who regularly apply Roundup in their crops. You would send them a questionnaire asking them, did you wear personal protective equipment every time you applied? Uh, you know, what doses, how frequently? And then you would also check out their medical records and see what diseases they have. And you'd look for associations between the two. Do people who spray more have higher incidences of this disease or not? So uh, the research in this area suggests that there are chronic effects of many different pesticides uh, just through these associational studies. Uh, clearly, there are disadvantages to this sort of study in the sense that there are lots of variables in people's lives that can cause them to develop certain diseases. And sometimes the relationships that people find are really tangential, like applying pesticide X gives you a 14% chance. Uh, you're 14% more likely to get some disease than uh, people who don't apply that pesticide. But... Uh, recently in the news, uh, have people been following the Roundup controversy with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yeah, right? So that's a good case of an associational study. A French team basically looked at uh, farmers from across the world and did a correlation study between Roundup application and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and they found a correlation, and it's led to the lawsuit that's currently, what is it, like five Californian farmers? are suing. Either way. Either way, there's a big lawsuit going through, and there's a, uh, some evidence that uh, Monsanto wrote some of the safety studies uh, that were used to get Roundup cleared as uh, safe with no chronic effect. So uh, we'll see how that pans out in the future. Just recently, I saw a study from a Chinese, well, it's not a study, it's preliminary data from a Chinese team that suggests that uh, pyrethroid insecticides can cause um, male children to go into puberty early. So that's kind of curious. Uh, we'll see how that pans out, if, that's, if that ends up getting published or if there are. Again, should always be a little skeptical of scientific results before they're published and, uh, and uh, not to be like uh, culturalist or anything, but uh, a, lot, a lot of the science coming out of China is extra suspect because of the uh, reward system out there is based off of big publications uh, and numbers of publications. So a lot of scientists are under extreme pressure to publish as much and as wild of results as they can. So, uh, so suspect, but there is good science coming out of China too. All right. Where was I going with this? All right. So reducing risk. So the point is that there are these acute impacts of pesticides on people, and we need to be extremely careful with those, but also there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there are chronic toxicities. And so what are the things we can do um, in order to prevent these toxicities as much as possible? Uh, what are the practices that are best? And essentially what it comes down to is that we should try and practice maximum caution when handling pesticides as much as possible uh, especially to avoid uh, contact with bare tissue or any sort of way that the toxin could get into your body. So for the rest of the lecture, what I'm going to do is basically split up this between um, sort of ways that pesticides get into agricultural workers, so looking at that acute toxicity, and then I'm going to have another section where we're going to talk about how we can reduce risk to non-targets. Uh, to organisms in the environment and to uh, people who are using shared resources with agriculture, such as water, soil, and air. So today, I think we're probably just going to get through that first section, and we'll tackle this second one uh, whenever we meet after spring break. So a lot of this is going to be somewhat common sense, but bear with me. So as far as pesticide exposure is concerned, there are really four major routes. There's dermal exposure through the skin, there's oral exposure through the mouth, uh, respiratory exposure through the lungs, and ocular exposure through the eyes. These are the easiest ways for these chemicals to get into your body, and you might have to get kind of creative to find another way for them to get in. So, dermal exposure. This is the most common exposure route. It's really uh, 
Makes sense considering that your entire body is covered in skin, so it makes sense that the uh, pesticide is most likely to come into contact with it. And there's sort of two routes of injury through this, right? On one hand, getting pesticides on your skin can cause injury to the skin itself. So you can have irritation, welts, blisters, uh, you know, over long periods of time you could develop an allergic reaction. Then on the flip side, there's always the possibility that the pesticide will be absorbed through the skin and enter your bloodstream and get to other more sensitive parts of your body. Um, this makes sense, especially when you're dealing with things like insecticides. Insecticides are designed to be absorbed by fat bodies inside the insects, so they're more likely to go through your skin than they are to be washed off by water, because they're more attracted to the fats and oils in your skin than they are to water itself. Uh, so one tricky thing with this, and sort of a, an insidious way that pesticides can get through your skin, is just that you're sitting there using your hands to mix the pesticide, and then, so you got pesticides on your hands, and your hands are surprisingly resilient to absorption. You don't get a whole lot through your, through your hands or through your arms, but you have certain parts of your body that absorb pesticides like crazy, because you've got a lot of oils, you've got a lot of blood vessels really close to the surface of the skin. So what I've got here is just a, a map of the human body with relative absorption rates uh, put on it. And all these absorption rates are relative to the forearm. They consider the forearm to be one of the least absorption, uh, I'm saying absorption, yeah, absorptive parts of the body. And so the idea is that the forearm is a one. If you're higher than that one, that means the body part is more absorptive than that. You can see your hands are a 1.3. They're not a whole lot more absorptive. But let's say you're mix mixing a pesticide. It's hot out, sweaty. You wipe your hand across your forehead. Now you've got pesticide on your forehead, which is more than four times more absorptive than your hands are. And worst case scenario, let's say you go and use the restroom, and you touch your junk, and yeah, your genitals are about 12 times more absorptive than your forearms are, and about you know, 10 times more absorptive than your hands are. And uh, generally, that's too close to various reproductive organs uh, that I don't want toxins floating around in, and so generally, the idea is, I've seen this a lot working in molecular labs. People put on their gloves, and they're thinking, well, I'm protecting myself from these chemicals. And then they, like, scratch their face. And it's like, you've got the chemicals on your gloves, <laughs> right? <laughs> so just don't touch yourself. Like, <laughs> it takes a little bit of practice. You kind of learn just to stand like this <laughs> with your gloves sticking out, right? But that's the basic idea, is that it's easy enough to say, I'm wearing gloves, I'm fine. But just remember, you can't touch any other part of your body with that. But typically, right, dermal exposure, it's going to manifest as skin irritation. So maybe you'll get some redness, itchiness, maybe blisters or uh, uh, pustules at very bad exposures. Uh, and oftentimes, the, let's see, boy, these did not turn out. By the way, do you see this guy's got kind of a red ring on his midriff, probably where his shirt didn't quite cover his belly entirely, uh, but above his pant line. This is a sort of a big blister on a dude's elbow. But, uh, there we go. That's better. So ultimately, uh, sometimes the first couple exposures you can have, you're not going to have a real serious reaction, but your body can slowly develop an allergic reaction against chemicals due to multiple low exposures. So maybe a later exposure will be much more serious than the initial one. Oral ingestion, basically consuming pesticides. This is almost entirely accidental. You're either like this guy and you're out spraying and you go to eat something, and you don't wash your hands first, don't do that, right, clearly. Uh, the other big way you see this is through people storing pesticides in uh, containers other than the ones they bought them in, uh, oftentimes doing stupid things like storing them in old like soda or tea bottles, and then some guy walks in and sees you know, a bottle laying there, there's always some guy who eats the food out of the fridge. Um, some people may say that's justice for the guy who eats things out of the fridge, but, but some people just don't know better like kids, right? And so generally, right, if you have a pesticide, use the original package to store your pesticides. If you don't want to use that much room, just make sure it's in some sort of container that's clearly labeled what it is and it's not some sort of food container. Uh, I know a lot of people, what they'll do also is you don't keep empty containers around because they'll have trace amounts of the pesticide in them. You don't want someone to store something else in there 
And so what a lot of companies will do is they'll say, when you use the pesticide, just take a screwdriver or a knife or something and punch a bunch of holes in it. And that way, no one can use it again. And I'm going to group inhalation and ocular because they're both very similar. Um, these two are generally the least common exposure routes. Uh, and it's generally because people are pretty good with personal protective equipment in this. Most all applicators wear goggles or respirators, uh, so they don't get a whole lot of uh, sort of exposure this way. Plus, your eyes and your lungs are relatively small, so you're not going to splash into them as frequently. But the downside of this, of course, is that the eyes and the lungs both have a ton of connection with your circulatory system. So getting even a small dose in your lungs will quickly spread through the rest of your body through your blood. So generally, again, this is a situation where if you wear the proper equipment, you'll be fine. Which transitions really nicely into my how do you risk, reduce risk? Wear the proper equipment. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, reduces direct contact with pesticides, and that's really the name of the game, right? If you're not exposed to the pesticide, then you don't have to worry about any of these effects. And so these are generally going to be any sort of waterproof or chemical proof barrier you put on your body, whether that's a jumpsuit or a respirator or goggles, all of that stuff. Uh, if you're not sure what you're supposed to wear, look on the label. The label will spell everything out uh, in great gobs of detail. Uh, in addition to reducing risk, another way is uh, in addition to wearing the proper equipment is just to use mixing technologies that reduce the amount of physical exposure that you have to the pesticide. And what you'll see is that nowadays there's lots of companies that are coming out with pesticide formulations where you don't actually have to touch the pesticide itself at any step during the process. Uh, things like water-soluble bags, these guys. So it's a plastic or a paper type material that has the pesticide in it. And when you throw it inside the tank, the plastic or the paper will dissolve in such a way that it will not you know, clog up the machine or anything. And the pesticide will actually go in and mix nicely. So at no point are you actually touching the pesticide. You're just touching the bag, the pesticide's in. Or you've got things like closed systems closed mixing systems where you essentially have a machine that you can just hook into the pesticide container. It'll pull it up and deposit it directly into your uh, spray tank and do the mixing there. So at no point was the pesticide outside of a container. And of course, uh, you're not just concerned at the application stage, but also any stage after that where the pesticide is out in the environment. And so we use things like restricted entry intervals or just the mandatory period of time after a pesticide application where people cannot re-enter the field. Typically because there's some sort of active ingredient still out there. So oftentimes what you'll see in fields, right, is you'll see the little danger signs, skull and crossbones. Um, typically they'll have a date on it when you're allowed to come back in. I believe by federal mandate, you're required to notify anyone who's working within Anyone who could be working in the field and works within a quarter mile of it, you're supposed to notify them every time you spray. Um, it doesn't happen. No, it does not happen, but you are supposed to. Uh, perhaps a more strenuous version of this would be the uh, applications around schools, right? That if you're applying within a mile of a school, you're supposed to notify them every time you apply, and they do regulate that pretty tightly. Might be two miles. We'll see. All right. And so speaking of federal mandate, pesticide safety is mandated through FIFRA, the Federal uh, Fungicide, Insecticide, Rodenticide uh, Act. Oh, look at that. Right? And specifically, they've got this thing called the Worker Protection Standards Amendment. And essentially, this just sets all the basic regulations around worker safety. So if you go through it, there's a lot of things it does. But essentially, it's just there to protect workers from unsafe workplaces. So they've got standards for, like, a, it prohibits any application type that is um, not label standard. So if you apply it in such a way that the label does not describe, you could be sued through FIFRA. Uh, it establishes the REIs, the personal protective equipment you're supposed to use. And also, if you're exposed, it requires uh, all growers, all employers, to basically provide 
some of the basic things you need to protect yourself. So for example, it requires uh, that at any application you have soap water towels available, uh, the ability to transport people to a hospital if need be, uh, just all sorts of sort of mandatory uh, safety features. And because we live in California, there's an extra layer. There's the California Code of Regulations. So these are state laws that regulate worker protection associated with pesticides. And in many cases, these are going to be either identical to those outlined by FIFRA or more strenuous. And then finally, there are these things called safety data sheets or SDSs. Sometimes they're called MSDSs. And these are basically just uh, a sheet that's produced by the chemical manufacturer and they have all of the essential information around its safety. So they're going to list its toxicity, uh, its impact on the environment, uh, LD50s, uh, all the instructions on sort of, uh, uh, basically if you get exposed they tell you what to do. And so by law, uh, work, uh, companies are required to provide these to anyone who works with that chemical. And ideally, they're supposed to have them on site with them when they do the application. Does anyone remember a few years ago, um, they had that huge explosion in China. Uh, there was a warehouse in sort of a, a railroad district, and it was on fire, and it exploded, and it basically just like leveled almost like a whole kilometer of area around it, killed several thousand people. So one of the big problems they had with that fire was that the warehouse contained some extremely unstable compounds in it, and they didn't realize it at the time. So when the fire started, all these firefighters basically rushed to the scene. There were you know, hundreds of them essentially trying to put the building out, but then the building exploded once they were all there working on fire. In the US, because every building that contains chemicals is required to have these MSDSs on site, if you were to show up at that fire, they would immediately look through those and see if there was anything potentially explosive there, and then they would basically just evacuate the area instead of trying to put the fire out. Because the, the reasoning is you want to get everybody away from the explosion rather than trying to save the single building. So MSDSs are a big deal in the United States and a, a lot of uh, other countries where it's highly regulated. So like I said, you have to have uh, access to these most all the time. So with that, we'll cut out a little early. I don't want to get started on environmental risk. We'll uh, touch on that whenever we get back from the break. So Tuesday lab, enjoy your break. Uh, Thursday lab, I'll see you in like 45 minutes.